time job as a manager of the shoe department at Sears and Roebuck in Westwood. So he'd work a 40 hour week and take carry a full load and belong to a fraternity. So he was a busy boy. <laughs> and that was how hard it was to get through school when you didn't have any money. You just worked your tail off. The middle of his last semester of his senior year, he was drafted in March, and they called uh, hundreds of boys from UCLA and they picked them up on the campus in these great big buses. And we have pictures of that, uh, just a mass of young men. Because 43, things were still getting very tight in the war and we were fighting on two fronts and all of America was struggling to win that war. And we all worked hard. We all um, had rationing. Uh, I remember in high school, when the, uh, after uh, VE Day, I mean after um, Honolulu was bombed, Hawaii was bombed, we, um, I sat in the uh, hallway, a whole bunch of us did, with typewriters, and all the little people in town were lined up on, for every Saturday, and uh, we issued uh, the books for uh, rationing. There was food rationing, there was gas rationing, tire rationing, and just about uh, the coupons. You'd have so oh, many coupons, coupons that you could use, and uh, you had a very few meat coupons. And so each person was given a book, and so the families had to juggle around to see how they could get their food. And of course, there was almost no sugar, so there was very little canning done as far as that went those years. But everybody saved grease, they saved string, they saved aluminum, uh, we saved old tires. We didn't throw away anything in those days. You saved fat. You know, if you cooked bacon, you drained the fat off and put it in coffee cans, and then you took it to where it was recycled. I don't know what they did with it, but <laughs> and so we were all fighting that battle uh, and trying hard as all the men were gone. And uh, Dad was in Army training or officers training. Uh huh. He, he first he just you know went in as a private, right. and uh, then he applied for officers training, and so he in very few months he was accepted. And he first went to uh, Galveston, Texas, where he was a uh, uh, private and went through his basic training. And then once you get through basic training, then he applied and went to, I believe it was Georgia, to take his, uh, he, he decided to go into the anti-aircraft, which was all based here in the United States, and he thought that was pretty smart. <laughs> and then as the war was drawing uh, nearer an end, I think in 44, or it was think they knew that we weren't going to get bombed here in the United States. They trans they just did away with the anti aircraft. So that's when he transferred to engineers, and that was uh, then when he had to go back and be retrained for an engineer officer. That delayed his being going overseas, which he thought was. Now you were still in Texas. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. What were you doing? Uh, I was going to school. Oh, okay. See, I did nothing but go to school. And so um, we, when he returned from the war, uh -huh. when, well, when was that? Uh, you mean that was it just before we got married right. in uh, September of uh, 45. Okay. Because the war ended that summer of 45, ended in August mm -hmm. of 45. He, he waited till you graduated. Uh -huh. All right, and then he still was not discharged uh, because he hadn't been in the service. You know, he'd been in since '43, and they had to have a certain number of points, and points overseas counted more. So he wasn't discharged until February of '46. At that time, we were uh, at in Medford, Oregon, at a camp there, <clears throat> and that's where he was discharged, and came home from there. You, you were 
were up there with yes, him. Yes, I was there with him. I, I was with him through the those last few. And, and that was interesting. You know, you couldn't find a place to stay around army camps. Uh, there was no housing to speak of in these little towns. And we went, our first place that I we lived in, in um, uh, Henderson, Kentucky, was a basement. And it had a little curtain uh, kept away from the furnace so that they put a double bed in there. And then they'd put a little kitchen sink and a uh, little apartment refrigerator over another corner of the basement, and that was our home. <laughs> and then uh, we were lucky, though. Uh, some people lived in what was a gasoline station, and it was all windows, you know, the office. <laughs> and they had, the, they had their little home set up in a gasoline station that had been deserted. <laughs> and then when we moved to Oregon, we had a little two-bedroom place that was out in the country and that uh, it had a wood stove to cook by, but we had electricity, mm -hmm. and we had wood to heat by and wood to cook on. So I'd, I'd cook the meal on the wood stove as a new bride and not really knowing all that much about cooking. Well, you were a home economics fan. I know, but I didn't know that much about <laughs> cooking. I thought I did. And so I'd cook there, and then uh, the water for the uh, shower heated in the re reservoir of the wood stove. So. We'd keep the meal warm. We'd both go jump in the shower, get our shower, and then come and eat our dinner, because we had to feed. Otherwise, the water would have gotten cold after the uh, wood fire was off. <laughs> so we had to. And our bed was so the double bed just fit in the bedroom, so that you had to crawl over the end of it to get into the bed. There was nothing, no way on the side you could get in the bed. <laughs> and, and we also had to have wood delivered for the wood stove and for our heat, heating stove. And uh, so they said, how much do you want? And he said, well, I guess just half of a load, you know, would, both of us never having had a wood stove. And they came out with this dump truck and dumped about 15 feet tall pile of wood. <laughs> Bob spent about two weeks, I think, stacking that every night when he'd come home from work. <laughs> so that was our Oregon experience in the wild. <laughs>
And uh, then we even bought a new Ford so that we had um, moved to a duplex on Washington at that time, which was unfurnished. And we got it all furnished. And Janet came along in 1949. And uh, by that time, we had accumulated enough money that he, we could put a down payment on a little three-bedroom track home that was very shabbily built in South Whittier. And uh, we thought it, oh, it was just great. And that was our home for uh, about two year or a year, really, um, because he got then called back to the Korean War in 1950, at the end of 1950. Uh, Nobody else got called back in the Korean War but us in Whittier. <laughs> he had a special MO, which is uh, oh, it's something that stands for what you're capable of doing. And because in the service he had had searchlight training in anti-aircraft when he was uh, taking his training, the little machine up in Washington, D.C. picked that out as an officer with searchlight training. And they had decided to, in the engineering corps, uh, have searchlights in Korea to light up the sky at night for night fighting. And this is the first time and only time searchlights have been used for that. And the Chinese uh, and Koreans uh, always fought at night and uh, would infiltrate lines at night. And it was, of course, very hilly and mountainous there. Uh, so their job was to light up the sky at night. They'd try to bounce their lights off of clouds, low-hanging clouds. And then it was kind of, they were called the Moonlight Calvary because they were attached to the Calvary Division, even though they were the Engineering Corps. <laughs> so he had a platoon of, um, I think, six searchlights, and I don't know how many men to man those. And he was uh, way ahead of his, um, in advance of his headquarters for the rest of his little um, engineering company that he was a part of. And he used to write these letters back to them that we have copies that are so funny because they were about 50 miles behind him. And so he'd talk about, you know, if you need any help with catching butterflies in your nets in the moats back there, I'd be glad to come back. and help you. Uh, and if you want to make these uh, uh, dangerous journeys up to my front line to see me, I admire your courage and, and strength to do this. Because <laughs> he was all by himself up there. <laughs> uh, so they, I imagine he was quite a target, too. They were. They, and so what they would try to do is to jiggle the lights and turn them off and then kind of move them a little bit and then turn them back on again, you know, if the, if the firing was getting too near their light. Oh, right, yeah. So they had to be, you know, a little sneaky about how they did it. And they were written up, I had quite a few articles about it um, because they were unusual in what they were doing. And he lived in kind of a converted little trailer that they'd built a shed over the top of it. and. Uh, he had a little hanging light that came down over a little piece of wood he used for a desk and he had his bunk, you know, on the other side. It was, you know, about six by six feet yeah. space. And uh, many nights, uh, this uh, shade that he had on his light would... Sorry. That's okay. Hey, we should probably just... So, in Korea... Oh, yes, I was talking about this lampshade that was coming down and would hit the light bulb every time uh, one of their uh, bombs would go off and would rattle and shake everything around them. And uh, so it, every night, it, not every night, but uh, it often would k break the light bulb. And Bob, th this is sort of the joke of the family, that once he's asleep, he's just really dead to the world. And he never would hear any of that. He would sleep through all of that, the crashing of the light bulb, and the only way he'd know the next morning uh, that he had to watch to be sure he didn't cut his feet on the light bulb when he woke up. <laughs> so anyway, he, he didn't, they weren't under real danger there for too long, just a few months, uh, because then they decided on that piece at the 38th parallel. 
so they stayed there uh, but it was there was not the fighting then but it was boring very boring 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 and he was in Korea for a year before they shipped him home now wasn't Janet born she was but born uh, before he went to Korea she yeah. was born in July of uh, 49 and he went to Korea uh, he she was a year and a half old when he had to go and he flew uh, we had driven all the way to Fort Bragg thinking he would be stationed there in North Carolina the three of us drove there and uh, we're living in the officers' quarters there for that they provide for uh, families. And the, we were there one week, and he had orders to be flown all the way to Korea from North Carolina. That's the Army for you. And uh, our furniture was all en route from, on a, tr you know, a van from California. So I saw him off at 5 a.m. in the morning with Janet in my arms. It was in January, it was really cold. And here was this big old army plane uh, all fired up and the engines were going and the soldiers were all getting on board and he came over and kissed me goodbye and walked over and got on this big old plane. And we stood there and felt that rush of air as that huge thing took off. We were just about oh, you know, 50 feet from it, because they let us go right out to it. <laughs> so that was the last I saw of him for over a year. Then I had to get back to uh, Texas, and my father came out in a bus, drove our car, which was that uh, Pontiac convertible, that drove Janet and I back to their home in Texas, and that's where I stayed for quite a few months until I finally decided to come to Whittier and uh, stayed with his folks for a few months. Mm -hmm. And before the service, um, you know, we'd been married five years, and uh, Bob always kept investing in, in cheap little rentals. So by the time he left in 1950 for the service, we had about $5,000 saved in five years. And uh, we decided to invest it in three rentals uh, on Milton and they were old, old homes. And it turned out uh, it was a pretty good investment that they rented for pretty good interest on your money. It was better than if you put it in the bank. So uh, one of those became vacant, the middle one, which was a one bedroom. And uh, so I moved in there for the balance of the time before he came back. And. Uh, we were always sorry that we didn't take that $5,000 and we could have bought a home on the beach at Huntington Beach. And we decided it would be too difficult for uh, his mother to have to fool with renting it, you know, going down there and checking the rental things. And so we thought it wouldn't be a good investment. <laughs> if only we had known, because of course the old homes on Painter never did amount to much of anything <laughs> in inflation. And we finally used that money to uh, build our home on Sunset, which we had to have $5,000 to buy that lot. And uh, the home cost us uh, 25000 So that was uh, how we got the home on Sunset that we built. Uh, so. He came back from Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, what year? Uh, in um, 50, the end of '51, mm -hmm. and uh, he was released uh, soon after that. They sent him to uh, uh, the Puget Sound, um, Port Townsend. The I can't think of the camp up there now. It, well, it was a fort, Fort something, but it's been done away with. And uh, we stayed there for uh, several months. And then in the spring of 52, <clears throat> came back home. And that's... Uh, so when you came back, you had, do you have the Milton place still? or uh, you... We had the Aldrich place, the three bedroom on Aldrich is where we uh, okay. lived. Uh, it, it had been rented. See, we rented it too. Okay. So we rented the rentals and we rented uh, our home on Aldrich. So uh, we got it back. And we stayed there until we bought the place on Sunset to build in 55. So that was the 
the progress of houses. And Dad uh, went back into the uh, advertising. advertising. He went to, to work for the uh, Paul, the man who had taken over his advertising accounts in Los Angeles. And he didn't like driving to Los Angeles, and he didn't like working for somebody else. So he became manager of his major account, uh, which was Red Star Fertilizer, and stayed with them for about two years, maybe a year, I guess about a year. And then he decided to go on his own. And that's when he started developing into a manufacturer's rep and went through all the many, many products that he finally ended up mostly in irrigation field, drip irrigation and regular irrigation. And that was where then he developed that business for the rest of his life working for himself. He didn't like to work for anybody else. <laughs> um, so now we're in the Whittier home, the Sunset home. Sunset home where we stayed for 30 um, years. We moved in there in 55 and I left it in 88 after Bob had been, uh, Bob died in 84. So I stayed there a while. but. But it was a beautiful home. We loved it and uh, raised four beautiful kids, children there, not kids. <laughs> now, let's uh, see. We're so now I guess through, through the 60s now we're into. Uh-huh. Because uh, uh, Steve was born when we were on Aldrich uh -huh. in that home in 53. And then Carolyn and you were born on Sunset, because Carolyn was born in 57 and you in 65. So we have our, our life on Sunset really now, I guess. That right. And Dad had <laughs> developed his business from Randall Sales to uh -huh. Global, Global Irrigation. Mm -hmm. through. I can remember sitting at the uh, breakfast table looking through a thesaurus with him of uh -huh. uh, what a good name would be for the uh, company. Oh, oh really? <laughs> I don't remember that. You know, a whole story, of course, is life on Sunset uh -huh. and uh, how fortunate all of you were to have one home that was very comfortable and very uh, great neighborhood and lots of friends and everybody knew everybody and you were close to everything and it was a great place to live and I really loved it and because it was so ours that we had really helped design it with Lee Ellis as the architect and that we kept uh, uh, telling Lee what we wanted like um, we knew we wanted that one big long room across the back that could be opened up uh, for living, den, and dining that was part of the patio and extended living. And uh, it occurred to us that we didn't want to look out on just concrete, so we had Lee drop out the concrete for uh, beds right next to those big windows so that we could grow things in the patio in those beds. Mm -hmm. And people weren't doing that then. I mean, it was kind of a new idea. And I remember we didn't want uh, in, the, in the breakfast room for a post to be in the middle of that, the glass windows that were coming together that looked out over the little garden and up to the hills. We wanted an unobscured. And uh, so Lee was able to work out the support of that by not putting a, a post in that corner and just having glass meet glass, which was very innovative, he said. But it worked. <laughs> and, you know, I had them design the kitchen just for me, the way I wanted, uh, where I wanted my flour bin, my sugar bin, where I was going to stack my mixing bowls. Everything had to be just at the right space. Yeah. Yeah. And it worked out great. It, uh, was a very efficient kitchen, easy to for, and yet people could move in it. It wasn't that tight, though it was a galley style, because that's the most efficient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd learned that in home ec. <laughs> and during that time, 
Uh, you, you didn't have another job then? After. I never worked again after I quit teaching at uh, Whittier High School. Okay. I never worked for money. <laughs> Uh, though I did, uh, you know, after all of you were grown, I did spend time uh, whenever Bob needed help at the office. Um, we had um, what was called block parties for many, many uh, years at Christmas time because we were a dead end street. It was sort of a double block we had there, but it was a dead end street. And uh, Bob one year said, You know, you know all the women because of the children playing together and you've gotten acquainted being at home all day. And he said, I really don't know too many of the people except the ones right next door. So that was when uh, I decided we would start having uh, the block party where we would go to four houses. Uh, we'd have uh, our appetizers at one and salad and then the main course and then go to the fourth house would be dessert. And uh, every year, four different homes would sign up for this. And so it was passed around. And uh, this was just for the adults. The children didn't go to this. <laughs> and of course, it was a pretty big house full just for the adults when everybody came. Because just about everybody participated every year. We'd have a meeting in, uh, at, uh, in think, November to decide who's going to have their home and set it all up. And we did that for a number of years. I can't remember just how many. And then we even had some uh, block parties where we pooled our uh, fireworks on 4th of July down at the end of the street. And everybody shared the, that sitting on the curb. So it was a, a good uh, street for the children to grow up on. They felt that they were welcome in any home on the street and were known on our, any home on the street. So it was a wonderful experience for children and for us, too, to have that many friends. And some of the friends we're very close to because they were also in our church. There were four couples on the street that all belonged to our first Christian church, the Holdermans and the Coxes and the Tetrels and the Bates. And so that was a special bond and still is. Then um, in 1982, Bob discovered that uh, he had blood in his urine. And he was sent to the hospital for x-rays, and they found a tumor in the kidney. And so we waited to get the doctor that he wanted that is nationally known, a Dr. Skinner from USC. Had to wait two weeks for him to come home from Europe. And he had very, very serious surgery at Good Samaritan Hospital, where they had so many doctors around him they could hardly get in to work uh, because they removed uh, a kidney. And he had uh, serious heart problems, so they had to have the heart cardiologist doctor there at all that, through that surgery. And he survived it, and they kept him nine days in intensive care and then about a month in the hospital. But uh, he recovered, and he even went back to work. In fact, uh, he didn't even know that the cancer had reoccurred until a year later at a checkup. They found that it had gone to the lungs, and that was bad news. They put him on chemotherapy, which wasn't too offensive to him. He wasn't too ill with that. And he even went back to work all of that time, and I think he worked until two days before he died, uh, though he was pretty weak at that point. And uh, we were pretty sure the cancer had spread probably going into the brain because he was having a little trouble when he wanted to play cards and play gin rummy. He'd get a little confused on the counting of the score. And so we had made an appointment to take him over to uh, Norris Cancer Center to have x-rays done uh, the morning that he died. Uh, I woke up, and he usually always gets up and takes a shower first. So, And I didn't hear the shower. I heard him get up, because I was sleeping in another bedroom, because my snoring was bothering him at that period. And 
I heard him get up, and then I went back to sleep. And then after a while, I hadn't heard any more noise, so I went in there, and uh, he was on the floor in the bathroom and had died quite suddenly, we think, is that, uh, and they believed that it was probably uh, coronary. Uh, or stroke that had caused it. But he seemed to have just, um, uh, the way he had fallen and everything, uh, that it, he had collapsed and probably had died just rather quickly. We hope that was the case. And anyway, he, he I did discover him quite early because I had just been dozing. And that was the uh, end of a beautiful life. He was 63. And that was in February 2nd of 84. And I lived four more years in that home before I decided that it was too much to take care of. And so I moved with Doug's help out to uh, Landmark, which is a retirement community, and, and have my beautiful two-bedroom home condo here that I just love and feel very comfortable and secure. So I've made a good life here and uh, just hope to stay healthy and enjoy all my grandchildren, which are seven now. <laughs> Remarkable. Someday, great-grandchildren, I hope.